What is CET? UAE, we know CET means? C Central European time. Okay. That's me here. <laughs> okay. We have just lunch time soon here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, a very warm welcome to all of you joining us from Arthrex, Ivana, and myself, Vishal Viga. Now, before we commence with today's interactive webinar, it is my legal obligation to inform you that this session will be recorded and subsequently may be broadcasted on social media platforms. Now, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce you to our international experts and panel for today's session. Joining us from Europe, Norway, is Dr. Martin Polshek, and from South Asia, India, is Dr. Nilesh Kamath, Dr. Ramkant Agarwal, Dr. Sundarajan, and Dr. Vivek Pandey. Now, before I hand you over to Dr. Mark Ferguson, who will moderate today's session, I would like to cover a couple of house rules. So please, we kindly ask that you remain on mute with your cameras switched off. And this really will help to create a calm atmosphere so that all of us can enjoy the information that's being shared. And we want today's session to truly remain interactive and engaging. And we ask you to put forward your questions using the chat box feature, which can be accessed easily via the icon that has been highlighted by the red arrow here on the top right hand of your screens. Now in the same chat box, and throughout today's session, there will be 13 poll questions being introduced. This again is a fantastic opportunity for you to express your opinions and your thoughts in a total anonymous fashion. And the results of these polls will be debated by our panel. We encourage you guys to participate. And as I mentioned, the poll will appear in the chat box and also flash up on your screen. That's it from my side. We hope you enjoyed today's session. I'll hand you over to Dr. Mark Ferguson. Thank you, Vish. Uh, greetings to all. Um, it's a great pleasure to be joining you here today. Shoal instability, one of my favorite topics, still remains one of the most hotly debated topics in sports medicine with many controversies. But I, I really am grateful to some of the leading international opinion leaders here today to share their knowledge and hopefully provide some clarity to this topic with some real clinical case presentations. I'll be your moderator. I'll be asking the hard questions. And first up, uh, treatment of the first time dislocator. Yeah, it's a perfect example of one of the unanswered questions especially with recent studies showing lower occurrence rates and slightly superior clinical outcomes with initial surgery. But I'll ask Dr. Vivek Pandey, uh, also known as the master of Manipal, to enlighten us a little bit on this. Dr. Pandey, over to you. Sorry, Vivek, I think you're on mute that end. OK, thank you very much, Mark, all the esteemed panelists and the delegates who have joined us for this fantastic webinar, which I'm also looking forward to learn a lot of bits. Um, so without wasting the time, let's start with the one of the most hot topic debated often on various forums is what do we do for the acute first time anterior dislocator? And we made it a bit more complex. So a 24 year old man was brought to the trauma center. You can see the picture on the left side of the screen with acute anterior shoulder dislocation due to a fall while playing football. Now, as far as his game is concerned, he's not a professional league footballer, but often plays as forward at local club on weekends. Career wise, he's pursuing masters in computer science. When we examined, we realized that he has an anterior dislocated shoulder, which you can see on the right side of his shoulder with the loss of the droid contour holding the hand in the typical posture and his neurovascular examination for local axillary nerve and distal brachial plexus were completely normal. Mark? Dr. Pandey, just before I go on, uh, you, you've put normal neurovascular examination. Uh, how would that influence your decision making uh, later on if he did have an axillary nerve palsy? 
Yes, yeah, so if he has, most of the time, these patients may have, let's say about 20% cases, may have some amount of neuropraxy of the axillary nerve. So one, you should always check the sensory examination. Motor might be a little tricky, but when you ask them to AB duct, you can feel the deltoid contraction. Now, once you have reduced, you have to let this axillary nerve partially recover before I embark upon any major surgical decision making. So that's how it influences my decision. And also just to remember, strangely enough, those patients with uh, neuropraxia have a lower recurrence rate. Whether it's the capsulitis that develops, I'm not sure. But yeah, thank you. Let's carry on. Yeah, so that's the preoperative uh, uh, pre-reduction x-ray, which you can see on the left side. This is the typical anterior dislocation of the shoulder, subglenoid appearance. And uh, most of the time, it's hard to take any other view, and that one view suffices. So all across the globe, almost, almost every case is reduced under the sedation. And yes, so can you go back, Mark? Sorry, I'm just going to go back one. So we're going to come to our first poll question already. Uh, this will appear on your screen in about sort of five to seven minutes, but I just wanted to sort of find out from everybody out there at this sort of stage, um, do you have enough information or what else would you do onto this? Um, while we're waiting for that poll to come up, uh, do you want to take us through some of your ideas with this, uh, Dr. Pandey? Yeah. Um... So I would like to ask the panelists, what, what do they feel, uh, especially in these cases, you know, initially when you have the patient who has got the, uh, you know, dislocation reduced. So what do they prefer? Do they always do this, just the brace rehabilitate and later call them for MRI or let's say do the MRI and CT scan both. CT arthrogram, I'm not very sure whether we are yet again doing again and again. Martin, so what, what, what do they do? What, in, what is the no? take of the panelist? What do they do? do, you do, always do the... Thank you for the question. Uh, this was around 25 year old male, was it? Yes, 24. Going, yeah. Yes, uh, <clears throat> I uh, I would uh, usually take the patient to outpatient uh, appointment after maybe four or five weeks and see how he's going and if he's if he is improving uh, and. Uh, do uh, feel that shoulder is better, then I would uh, proceed further with rehabilitation. But if I feel that the shoulder is still bad and he has apprehension test and he's uh, he's not better according to pain, then I will uh, start in considering taking any MRI and uh, see what happens. Maybe try, try to think on surgery if, if he's so not you, improving Martin? after five, six weeks. Yes. Martin, you want to say that you don't do MRI routinely now these days in these patients who are so-called athletes, even if they are weekend warriors, it's not a routine thing? Yeah, if, if they are professional athletes, like from some club or they are like, um, they do some professional sports, then we do MRI, but not on uh, like uh, ordinary patient. If I would have somebody which is in uh, teenager, like 15, 16, 17, then I will t take MRI. Uh, because I um, uh, believe that they have quite high recurrence rate when they are in teenage, uh, but when he's 25 and he does not have any bony <coughs> lesion or something, then I would maybe wait a little bit and see what happens. If it's then, first, it's unless better. until we do, unless no, we do the MRI, how do we know that there is no bony component? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's that's a good question. Yeah. Hmm. We, you could see something a little bit on on uh, radiographs, but it's not easy. No. Uh, you know, you expand your possible uh, plain X-rays to to include something like a Bernoulli view. But I think I think it's very topical. Is that you know I know a lot of people arrive already with the MRI scans in in India. It's often the first thing which they, what's done. So the additional cost of a CT scan after that um, is is controversial. You know, well, is difficult. And the other thing is, what does an MRI scan? I mean, you've got a documented proof of dislocation already. You know there's a dislocation. For me, the only thing adding to that with an MRI scan is whether I've got a haggle lesion or not. Um, and that would be the only reason to rush in ahead. Um, Mark, just to, 
Yeah, can I make a comment? Sure. Yeah, so, so Vivek, I think uh, both of us practice in the same part of the world and I, I don't do an MRI routinely for all my first time dislocators unless one, like what Martin said is less than 20. Second, less than 45, 50, because I'm, I want to rule out a rotator cuff there. And third Absolutely. thing, if on, if on x-rays, if I'm, I'm not very happy about it, and then probably I would take a call if at all, I want to do an MR or a CT or both. And probably I would cover that when I talk about my patient. So yes, I would probably put him in a brace. I would see him after three to four weeks. Once the pain settles down, and as Martin said, assess him clinically. If he is unstable, if there's apprehension, at that point of time, I can do an MRI. I'm still not burning any bridges. I'm not adding on to the cost. And either ways, if I see a labral tear, which is bound to happen, not every patient is someone where I'm going to offer surgery. So that's the thought process. I will agree, Dr. I Kamat. I, uh, I, I forgot the yes. calf lesion, also, of course. That's an uh, important uh, fact to consider. I think I have just changed the practice in the last few years. So anybody who is one who is less than 30, I mean, you can say definitely less than 25, and who has got the little bit higher velocity of injury. So a mere fall on the road and a dislocation, I would probably not do. But if it is a, you know, the game where there has been an injury, he has a massive fall, you know, some four people jumping on him, apart from road traffic accidents. Uh, yes, I won't do it immediately, but at three to four weeks, I would like to have, because there have been a lot of incidences where we and others have missed a bony bank card. And even if I miss one or two, I don't like that. Yes, Mark is right that you don't see anything else other than the soft tissue bank card in larger number of cases. But I personally would not, Today, in today's era 221, I would leave a, a bony bank card. But 30 plus, 25, 30 plus, yes, I would assess them. And then I leave them if there's no apprehension and tell them, okay, if it recurs in future, we'll see. Yeah, interesting. Vish, do we have the results of that first poll yet? Yeah, thank you, Mark. So interesting to see 71% are saying that they would brace and rehabilitate, 14% MRI scan and 7% are saying CT scan, and then another 7% are saying MRI and CT scan, and zero are saying CT arthrogram. Now, I just want to let the audience know that this poll is completely anonymous, so please feel free to put your submissions forward. You're not being judged, etc. and it's a great way just to understand what the audience is thinking. Thanks, Mark. Okay, no, thanks, Fish. Okay, let's go on. So. But Dependi, you ordered a MRI yes, scan. So looking at the, you know, the, the patient who had a fall while playing the football and two people had pushed him from behind, uh, we wanted to have an MRI which shows a typical bank art lesion here. Um, there is a very small hill sacs, very small. So I'm not very sure whether the bony component is involved or not, but may not be. Mostly it looks like a soft tissue bank art lesion. Can go ahead. Yes. Okay. So it's so, typical anto inferior. Yeah. So, you know, with, we're coming up to our next poll question. You know, with level one and level two evidence study, studies only showing slight preference to surgery, a lot of the decision making is driven by patient preference, I would gather. And the risk of recurrence is, that, is known to be the most important factor to influence the patient's decision. So it's therefore very important that we provide accurate evidence-based information to the patient. So in, in this patient, which, what do we say, 24-year-old, contact yep. athlete, is not professional, um, what is the risk of recurrence in that? The next poll question should be coming up now. So I'd really, really like to sort of, and, and it, there's, no, there's no real right answer uh, because every scenario is, differs ever so slightly. Um, but I think we've got a fairly good idea uh, of where this would be. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Dr. Pandy, while we wait for the results of that poll to come up. Yeah, again, you know, the rate of recurrence depends upon so many other factors. You know, the nature of injury, the concomitant lesion, the occupation of the patient. Uh, do they go back into this, you know, the high contact sports again or not. So there are multiple factors which lets the poll come up and then we'll discuss that how these how these various factors go, you know, influence the recurrences. 
there's been a very great, you know, good study, three studies which are done by the Roe, uh, Robinson and Hovilius in 1956, 2006 and 2008 respectively. And their follow-ups varying from five years to 25 years, especially the, the Hovilius study in 2008. Um, okay, so the Hovilius study, you know, let me not say, let, let the poll come. It almost, you know, say, before the Hovilius, we, we thought that especially the people who are younger, their recurrence rate can almost, you know, go up to 90%, but his 25 years follow-up changed the perception slightly. So let's have the poll and then we'll discuss a bit about what, what happens. What's the chance we of will, recurrence? Dr. Kamat, what, 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 what is the number that you normally tell your patient, a similar sort of patient? Yeah. So, so arbitrarily, if I were to give figures, uh, it's the younger patient that means less than 20. And I mentioned this earlier, less than 20. I tell them that nearly 70% of them would re-dislocate. When it's between 20 to 30, probably we are looking at something like around 60 to 60, 50 to 60. And that's, again, keeping the Hovelia study in mind. And more than 30, probably the number further goes down. So I think that's all of us who have been following this is, this one paper is someone that we quote that it's, and I know he's mentioned up to 22, 22 to 29, and more than 29. That's the age group criteria that he has. But like Vivek said, it's not just one single factor. It's the mode of injury, the age of the patient, generalized laxity, and a ton of other things. But these are the figures that I would give. So in this case, I would probably take the, the fourth, poll, fourth option, that is around 45 to 59. That's around 60%. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, you know, if you have a look at Robinson's uh, article, if you go onto the website, there is supplementary material there, which gives you a fantastic breakdown of almost 30 of the articles that are quoted. And it gives you a fairly accurate um, assessment of what the most likely incidence is for not only age, but activity as well. Vish, do we have the results of that uh, poll yet? Yes, thanks, Mark. So 71%, say 15 to 29%. And then interestingly enough, 30 to 44% is 14%, and 45 to 59% is 14%. So interesting okay. feedback, Mark. Uh, what uh, Robinson quotes, he quotes between uh, nearly 50 and 60% based on the you know, literature at this stage. So. Just highlights. Yes, Ovilius quotes. Ovilius gives about mean of 57 percent in this age yeah. group from 12 to 40. So maybe, yeah, as Nilesh said, we are looking at recurrence rate of four all. You know, calculating all possible other factors, somewhere about 50 to 70 percent lump sum. Uh, yeah, it seems that you know we're not telling the patients the correct information. Anyway, let's get on. <laughs> Our next poll already. Yeah, while they pull that up, um, you know, I think we're going to see a lot of people who are, um, who are going to say conservative management. Um, but I think you know you've got all the options there. I don't think you really add much uh, to it. Does anybody else have anything in the in the faculty who would another option which they would consider at this stage? Uh, Mark, um, can I add? Uh, Mark, yes. Sundar. No, regarding the, as Vivek said, that even I don't do routinely uh, MRI for all the patients, which Vivek quoted, one of the reasons could be uh, we may miss a uh, bony bank cord lesion. But we know that even the patient is not an overhead contact athlete like this patient, uh, but we uh, usually I do the counseling, same same what Vivek said, that we say around 50 to 60 percent the chances of recurrence rate. If the patient doesn't, if he still he wants to go for rehabilitation, still I would continue the rehabilitation instead of doing MRI scan. We all know that even if you missed bony lesions, they come with very good healing, even though literature doesn't show any big difference if you don't treat the bony bankards. There are many literature to support that equally for consistently treated bony bankard lesions with very good results. So unless the patient is a contact athlete like, like Vivek patient, then uh, I may not do routinely MRI scan in all my patients. Exactly, we, we follow the same. So not in every patient we would do, we would look at the profile of patient, mode of trauma especially, and what are they looking at to go back? Then these three things I will consider before I order an MRI. 
Do you have the results yet? And the mark also said that uh, no MRI may not give a much information, but we have a, here even uh, in Indian setup with all the insurance companies, you cannot operate any exactly. patients without MRI. So MRI is like for them, it's a uh, confirmatory tool for confirm the bank out lesion. So it is uh, mandatory for us to have an MRI if you want to go for a surgery. Although the most important criteria remains bone loss which is poorly vis visualized on an MRI. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. But Mark, is it, is it really a consideration in a acute case, the bone loss? Recurrent, yes. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think we'll see that later on with one of our, um, one of our examples, what's going to happen to the bone loss. Let's see what it's, let's, let's effort just to keep yeah. moving. Vish? Thanks, Mark. So 50% so they saying conservative management, um, where 28% would prefer arthroscopic open bank card repair. Um, and then the others, 14% are saying arthroscopic bank card plus ramp massage. And then primary bone block procedure is 7%. So very interesting. So 50% conservative. Okay, let's go on. Dr. Pandey. Yeah, so as we discussed, you know, we, we were thinking that how do we make this decision? So there are many reasons uh, which are there behind before you decide that you would like to operate these patients or you would leave them on conservative. And one of the most important things is natural history of primary anterior dislocation, which we just discussed uh, in a couple of slides back. Then the age of patient, what's the demand, occupation, level of athlete, contact sports, whether it is contact, non-contact, which side is involved, season, is it finishing season, beginning, what's his expectation, coach, parents, <clears throat> and these are the couple of associated pathology. So I personally believe that it's not one kind of a, you know, a dictum that you do this. It's an a la carte for that one particular patient. Make your own algorithm and you say, okay, his chance of redislocation is higher. If he's, let's say, younger age, he is a contact sport patient, is going back into the same kind of demand for head sport. There is a bony bank card lesion. Please go ahead and operate. He's not going to go back into the sports. He's a weekend warrior. Maybe he's ready to change his sports. Lesser injury. Maybe we can leave it for the time being. Okay. So what what, what was your idea? Now your next one is you did an arthroscopy. What was your idea going into arthroscopy? No, because he was a contact athlete. We discussed this, and he said he doesn't want any chance. And he's, you know, he's a forward player. He said, there's a chance that I will AB duct, I will externally rotate, there are, there's a chance that I may redislocate. So I want, you know, a kind of near perfect surety that it may not. I said, there is nothing like near perfect surety. You may still redislocate if people fall on your shoulder. But he said, no. And second thing is, his actually apprehension remained a bit positive. You know, he was a bit apprehensive even after rehabilitation at about two months. So we thought we'll go ahead. So this is the arthroscopy where it shows a medium size, small to medium size, a hill sacs, and uh, there was an anterior typical bank art lesion. You can see it's not the typical ALPSA with a very marginal cartilage injury. Okay. Would it? Would anybody call this an ALPSA? No. Okay. Let's go on. So that's what we've seen. Very, very well. Uh, excellent. Um, labrum, which has been well released, floating up nicely, and you say medium. Uh, did you measure the yes, hill sex? Yes, yes, we have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, we got the radiology report also. It was about 10 mm. Though now this medium to you know small and all these things are kind of irrelevant. Uh, but it was an on track lesion, so it, yeah, it was about 11 millimeter. Yes. Okay. So let's come up to our next poll. From what we've seen here is, you know, a hill six, which we're not quite sure how we graded it. Um, and a nice, healthy looking labrum. Would anybody change the initial treatment based on the arthroscopic findings? So would you still proceed to do an arthroscopy? Would you say looking at that, um, you'd include a rib massage? Um, or otherwise, would there more people going to be doing a primary bone block procedure? What what would be your you know, indication to do a reemplissage without any bone loss? 
Mark, you are asking me? Yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, over the years I have, you know, I have recently published our 10 year study in JLCS where we realized that um, medium to large size lesion, especially if they were off track, they had a very chance, high chance of um, uh, the, you know, recurrences. Uh, so over the years, I have a bit of kind of a bias because even after publication, when I started my study and I stopped taking the data, even later also, whomsoever dislocated with whatever is the reason, howsoever frivolous is the reason of dislocation, redislocation, there were the cases where we did not do remplissage. So over the years, I've realized that doing a remplissage is absolutely no harm and the restoration of the, the stability is almost akin to the primary bony uh, you know, the uh, the bony procedure, especially in those, you know, uh, subcritical bone losses. I'm not talking about more than 25%, but anything between 15 to 20 in contact athlete, there is no, you know, uh, bridges which are burnt if you just do an ad remplissage and give more stability. So in a contact uh, athlete, I, not, not a, you know, the javelin thrower kind of an athlete, but the footballers, yeah. I would not hesitate in doing the remplissage. And Vish, do we have the results out there yet? Yeah, indeed. Thanks, Mark. So 71% would say arthroscopic or bank art, um, open repair. And then 23% are suggesting that we go with an arthroscopic bank art plus ramp lissage, And 4% would say primary bone block procedure. Okay, so it's so before, gone before down. Mark, we move, Mark, we before move on to the... the in the next slide, I would ask, uh, you know, the Raman and Sundar, what's what's their take? Would they add remplissage or not in this patient? Looking at the findings, Sundar, Sundar, you have to unmute. Uh, uh, sorry. So uh, this is the first dis uh, first time dislocation um, is an on track lesion. And I found that the hill circulation is very superficial, not a huge. Uh, I think you measured around 10 mm or 11 mm. Yes. So, yes. so in this case, I may do only a arthroscopic bank art repair. I may not add a remplissage. The, because most of us, we know that when you have a recurrent dislocation, when you have an off-track lesion, we know that head will be already dislocated in front of the glenoid. So in these cases, we have a marked hill sacs, always I add a remplissage procedure. In the first time dislocators, if the hillsock defect is not that much deep, then I would add only bank art repair. Nilesh, what's your take? Yes or no? No, only arthroscopic bank art repair for this particular case. Usually we try to calculate HSI, but anyways, in this case, looking at the findings. Yeah, it was HSI, was, have... HSI was 11 mm. It's the same hill index. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, 11 mm, is that the length of it or the depth of it? Did you measure this before? Length, length. Are the, length, are the length the doesn't really help us much, does it? Um, I don't think I don't I don't know of any indication based on the length of a hill sex. Uh, so mayor and uh, most of all the hill sex indices all work on the depth. Anyway, let's move on a little bit uh, because we are taking rather a long time on this first case. I want to give everybody else a chance. Um, Dr. Pandey, I think you've been through most of this. Um, yes. So, yeah, I think. Um, so, what did we do in the end? Um, excellent looking uh, capsular labral repair and uh, with the extra assurance uh, of your remplissage as well. Fantastic case. I think it uh, really highlights a lot of the controversies which we have with our first time dislocator. Thanks, Dr. Penny. So the next one is to go on to uh, Dr. Nilesh. Thank you. Now let's add to the complexity of acute dislocations by adding some associated glenoid bone pathology. There's no one better to educate us than uh, Nilesh Kamat, also known as the pundit from Pune. Um, Nilesh. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for the kind words and uh, uh, Thanking everyone. Without further ado, I would start off with the case. So here we have a 26-year-old male, right-hand dominant, primarily sedentary lifestyle, just weekend sports. And this is more or less the profile in, of majority of patients in India. And he had a low-velocity RTA. Now, this is different than the Western world where 
most of the road traffic accidents are high velocity so he just fell off a stationary bike and he complained of sense of dislocation of the right shoulder he felt something popping out and going back in and this was around a week back and he presented uh, a week down the line with restriction of restriction of shoulder range of movement and associated with pain next please so he had been to a nearby hospital mark can we yeah he had been to a nearby hospital post injury and an x ray was done for him a conventional ap view and this is what the trend is in india that you would do a conventional ap view and he was told that everything looks okay and he was asked to to kind of use a sling and that was about it and that's when he came to me for a second opinion uh, can we go next if you look closely there's something happening along the anterior inferior aspect mark do we have the animation if we can just press on the next slide mark can you hear me yeah okay so here you can see along the anterior inferior aspect so what we did next was we did a true ap view for him a grache view and that's something that i would encourage all junior surgeons to consider getting a true ap view and here you can see that along the anterior inferior aspect there is an obliteration of the normal contour and you could see a black line or a lytic line running across indicating that the bony morphology might not be right so we went ahead and we we plan to go ahead with further investigation next slide please okay because the slides are not moving at my end i don't know if uh, mark can you hear me I can hear. Are you not seeing the CT scan? Is everybody else seeing it? Uh, okay, yeah, so if you go one slide yeah, back, I can see the CT okay, scan. Okay, so fair enough. So, all right, so I can see the image now. Probably there's a lag. So we did opt for a CT scan with 3D reconstruction. And mind you, that when you want to look for bony morphology, it's extremely important to ask your radiologist or your technician to give you that on-face view, where you see the face of the glenoid. mark can we have the slide with the face of the glenoid yeah that's that's where it is and and this is obvious out here that that we have a bony fracture a rim avulsion fracture you could call it as an iceberg type 1a type of fracture call it whatever it is but we know that the glenoid morphology is now affected and probably that brings us to the next poll isn't it mark we have a poll coming up absolutely correct so you know our poll here is conservative management um you know if we look back at the literature christian gerber's got 9 years results a uh, very low recurrence rate of instability but high arthritis rate uh open reduction internal fixation very difficult procedure without disrupting the the, the small fragment which is small um and they often comminuted and then uh would you if you were going to uh, most people i think nowadays would have uh, Uh, approaches from a surgical point of view and would you do it in a beach chair or a lateral decubitus position um and mark can we run across the faculty can we run across quickly with the faculty and what is their opinion what would they prefer sure uh, martin hello <clears throat> i would uh, definitely go for a lateral decubitus position and try to fix the the bone uh, fragment Uh, most All probably right. with anchors if um, if it's okay, we'll come back we'll come to the technique we'll come to the technique in the next slide probably we'll take yeah. another poll on that but, but you would like it, to yes. go yeah okay. okay i think i think just highlighting lateral because you just need all the space now uh, i think it does okay. give you some advantage over beach chair uh, vish do we have the results yet Yeah, thanks, Mark. So, sixty percent are saying in a lateral position. Twenty-four um, would opt for a beach chair, and then twelve percent are suggesting an orif, and four percent conservative. Okay. The list. Right. So, yes, absolutely, and yes, that was what my choice was as well. And I was someone who was formally trained in a beach chair. I've done these in beach chair, and trust me, it's a struggle as compared to the lateral position because you need that distraction both. in a medial lateral direction as well as a superior inferior direction anyways my plan of treatment was the arthroscopic bony bancard bridge technique described by peter millet and the rationale was straight forward because it's a two point fixation you have better rotational control you are preserving bone so you want that healing to be complete 
because of an arthroscopic procedure, the morbidity was less, and we're not putting in any metal work. So God for this, we know that they can go ahead to develop arthrosis. And if any additional procedure is required, probably 15, 20 years down the line, at least there is no headache of metal work. So that was what the rationale was all about. Next slide, please. Okay. So Dr. Kamat wants to do a double row fixation of millet. And what does everybody else have got want to do there? So you've got screw fixation, which is Torber's way. Um, the single point, which Sagaya uh, popularized with the anchor inferior and superior to the bone. And then the Italian way is where they do the ligamenta taxis. And they just put one superior anchor and they use the attachment of the genohumeral ligaments to reduce it. Um, any thoughts on that in the meantime, uh, Dr. Sunda? Uh, sorry, it was muted. Here, I think uh, the, um, the fragment uh, it looks to be not a very huge fragment, uh, uh, Nilesh. I think still I would go for a single point fixation like in Sugaya, where I had a sub sub uh, one superior and an inferior anchor. I think it will reduce it, the fragment pile. So I will go ahead with the uh, uh, single point fixation in this case. Okay, Mark, can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. So just before, again, coming back to one question earlier, how many of us would conserve fracture? What is the indication for surgery for these glenoid rim fractures? That's what if the faculty could quickly answer as the poll comes up. Percentage-wise or, or, or displacement type, how many, how many millimeter of step-off are we willing to take as far as the glenoid face is concerned? Sundar? I think this, the if the if the, if the step off is in the medial side is more than two to three mm down, then I would uh, go for a uh, uh, elevation and do the repair. And if it is if it is not displaced, mm -hmm. regardless of the size of the fragment, if it is not displaced, I do treat conservatively. Yeah, yeah, anyone yeah. else with different thoughts? Dinesh, don't forget you're opening up a bit of a can of worms here. What's the difference between yeah, the glenoid rim, <laughs> a glenoid rim fracture and a bony bankot? Um, yes, let's see what yes. the, let's see what everybody says. So I think that's that remains yeah. unresolved. Thanks, Mark. So, yeah, sixty-eight percent would go for a double row fixation. So the millet technique. I think that's to be shown to be biomechanically far superior uh, to the single point fixation. Uh, two recent studies. Um, let's let's carry on. Yeah, Great sure. Work. Next slide, please. Yeah. You're going to do Excellent. it in a lateral with the yeah. with traction? That's right. That's the star traction pulley. And can we go on to the next slide, please? Okay. And I think this three, point, this three point system is extremely important because it really gives you that distraction. And you can see that when you're seeing from the anterior superior portal, uh, I'm not seeing the video. Is someone else seeing the video? No. That, I'll show you the video there now. Yeah, okay. So that's the that's the video, and you can see that viewing from the anterior superior portal, that's the hematoma which is there, and you can see the chunk of fragment which is there. It's hinging on to the inferior cortex, but the mid anterior and the superior cortex is what is disrupted. And if you can actually assess, and we did assess the bone loss here, it was more than 20%. So again, from criteria perspective, 20% involvement, more than two millimeter step off, that's when probably I would definitely consider fixation. Next slide, please. So for those who are not aware about the millet technique, the first thing that needs to be done is that you need to clear the fracture hematoma and then you need to find a good angle of attack for the crater of the fracture. So you're going in the subchondral bone, in the cancellous bone. I prefer to use a biocomposite anchor so that there is no foreign body which stays within the bone. The next following step would be, next slide, please. Once you're done with this, you need to get or shuttle these two threads across the fracture fragment. And I think this is the most important step because you can cause either combination of the, of the fracture fragment or you could disrupt the labral ring. So you need to be very careful when you're doing this and whichever instrument of your choice, 
you could actually go in a sequential manner and get both the limbs across the fracture fragment. So you have two limbs then coming across the anterior inferior portal, which are through the fracture fragment. So I hope that is, that is clear here. Next slide, please. Once that is done, then you actually rely on your ligamentous attachment of the IGHL and you go in distal to the point where the fracture exits and you're going to do a capsular labral shift. And likewise, you're going to do the same thing at the superior edge of the fracture. Once you have these two points out there, so this allows the fracture fragment to approximate. And it's important for you to keep the labral ring intact. Because if you don't do that, then even if you're going to approximate the, the ligaments, the fracture fragment might not come in. And that's why maintaining that continuity of the labral ring is extremely important. But this causes the fracture to be aligned, but not compressed. And that is where your second pulley comes into picture, where you're going to use a knotless device and incorporate these two threads to come across and give a compression force. Can I have the next uh, slide, please? So that's me just checking the reduction and the alignment, which seems acceptable at this point. And this is the final step where on the edge of the fracture, and you need to see that your bone quality is good, you're going to use a knotless device. And with the two threads, you're going to apply adequate tension and you're going to then compress it and see to it that whichever device you're using Cut the threads as flush as possible to the articular margin to prevent any abrasion. So that's the final reduction. That's viewing from the posterior portal. Next slide, please, Mark. So that's the pre-op on the left of your screen, and that's the post-op image, which shows restoration of the bony anatomy and an acceptable reduction. Next slide. So that we get a CT scan for all our bony bank cuts at at six months, and this is his follow-up at one year. You can see incorporation of the fragment and he's back to all his activity without any pain or discomfort. Next slide, congrats. please. I think that's the Thank last you. one. Congrats, Dinesh. It's really, you've made a difficult case look very simple with uh, excellent outcomes. Well done. Uh, Vish, do we, so have any, do we have any um, questions that have come through? Have anybody on the chats? Not as yet, Mark, um, but I will certainly keep you posted as and when they do come up. I think the okay. poll's keeping everyone busy and thinking, eh? Uh, good news. Okay. Right, let's go to our next one. Uh, um, Mark, it's common. Mark, we, we do have bony lesions posteriorly. That can also be challenging. So, uh, from Dr. Agarwal, uh, also known as the guru from Gurungram, uh, he's going to tell us about posterior instability. Thanks, Mark, for your kind words. So I present to you this posterior instability, which is kind of difficult to pick up, difficult to assess, and may not be that difficult to, uh, to execute. So this was a 30 years old male with his dominant shoulder, right shoulder involved. He had this first episode of instability during bench press on incline, which usually is a cause for even anterior or the posterior instability both. Subsequently, he developed three to four episodes of instability in one year. Um, he used to play cricket uh, while bowling. He developed the instability while driving. He developed the instability, but each time he could uh, reduce the uh, instability himself. But he cannot throw now and has stopped playing cricket. And he does have morning soreness occasionally and wants to get back to normal and play sports again. So on examination, uh, he had a normal contour, no wasting, full range of active movements in all planes. His cuff was good. There was no impingement signs. His beaten score was six by nine. And he, was, he had laxity in the external rotation in a deducted position. He had no anterior apprehension. His O-brines was positive, but in both positions. Speed's test was negative, and the Kim's test produced, produced some discomfort and a click. So that is his uh, MRI, and we say the humeral head is slightly posteriorly subluxed. We do see a bony component there, but not a great uh, kind of a soft tissue disruption there. 
In the above view in the MR arthrogram, we see the soft tissue is still attached, but he has got some bony component going on there. Just, just to stop you there quickly, um, just that I'd love to hear from the rest of the faculty. Um, does anybody look at the glenoid version in, in a case like this, where we're looking at, it looks like there's some posterior instability? Any of the faculty? Well, they, this age, if, they, if they develop it a little early, then yes. But uh, yeah, we do look. But I'm not very sure. Should we be suspecting it at this age? You know, does it present so late? If earlier presentation, maybe 17, 18, yes, we start looking for the glenoid version, so certainly. And if it's a yeah. bilateral case. Raman, what, what's your take on this? Yeah, I mean, uh, the two times kind of a uh, uh, glenoid version would be definitely responsible for a constitutional static kind of a uh, picture of instability. Uh, but yes, uh, whenever we are assessing the MRI uh, in the CT scan, we definitely need to look at the retroversion. Although we need to decide that this is a traumatic episode, uh, a unidirectional instability. Uh, so maybe uh, what's, what's causing the instability is the question. Is retroversion contributing to the instability? And that we need to build in, in our uh, management program. Good, right. Here's your CT. That's the CT scan. Uh, so we see a big uh, fragment missing on the posterior inferior side, right? Starting from right from 6:30 to going up to the nine o'clock position. Uh, we do have a displaced fragment on the axial cut, uh, which is kind of splayed out on the articular surface and tilted. Uh, uh, can we have the next one, Mark? And it seemed a quite a big fragment, almost 12 millimeter, 1.2 centimeter, 1.18 centimeter. Okay. All right, we're coming up to our next poll. Um, it'll be very interesting. You, you didn't measure the amount of bone loss here, did you, as a percentage? No, I didn't measure the percentage mark, but because the, I could see the bony fragment. So. Mm -hmm. Not really a percentage. Uh, just if we if we look at all the literature, you know, I think you know Jim Bradley's most probably got the longest uh, series and the largest series with posterior, um, and they found that it's only glenoid bone with to be a significant risk factor. All the others, version, centricity of the head, reverse heel sex, uh, didn't influence as much as this. Let's go into this next poll. So this is just to ask now for the posterior glenoid. What would those people dialed and think is a critical bone loss uh, or that would influence their decision making and treatment? Uh, Nish, maybe you can start it off while we're waiting for those results. Is that me? From Hello. Yeah, can you hear me? No, can yeah, hear you? Can hear. Okay, so I think, yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. So this is what, what I routinely follow is the work done by John Tokish and co-workers, where although they have looked at the army subset, but uh, they have also spoken about 13.5 to 15, even posteriorly as the subcritical bone loss. So in practice, 15% is probably the ballpark that I would keep for a high demand patient. For low demand patient, around 20% is what I would look at. Yeah. Do we have the result of that poll? Yeah, thanks, Mark. It's, it's in, and we're looking at 48% would consider critical bone loss at 20% more, and then 15% more is 40%. We also have a question um, for Dr. Nilesh. It said, could we have treated the fracture conservatively? So, Vish, the reason why I gave my indications for surgery is because more than 20% of the involvement of the articular surface. And second thing is the fragment had also moved away medially more than two millimeters. So in my hands, I would be more comfortable treating it, uh, treating it surgically. And I, I agree, the only, the only number I know is the 13.5, and I think the Bethesda guys also 
uh, prove that as well. Um, so it, it's not as, uh, well, maybe it's as similar to anterior. Let's find out. Uh, so that's looking at it completely with a nice 3D reconstruction. Yeah. So, uh, so how do we go about this is going to be my next poll question. Okay. So your options are here, you, people want to do some more investigations. Um, do they ignore the fragment and just advance the capsular labrum to the edge of the fracture? Um, do we try and take it down and fix it with an anchor? Uh, open or posterior bone graft or arthroscopic? Whatever you do, whether you do a repair or graft, do you add a subscap tenodesis or McLaughlin procedure? While we're getting those poll results, uh, who wants to give us the idea there? Dr. Sundar? Yeah, uh, the, uh, 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 is there any measurement or given how much it was displaced, Roman, in the malignated position? Is it uh, how much it you is mean, depressed? The, you, the major lateral, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, it's around two millimeter. Around two millimeter. So, so I, I, I may add just to do a repair because it's already united. It's not more than two mm, and I may do a repair and add with the subscapular tenodesis. So you know, this is a couple of months down the line, hey? Yeah. Is it three years. How, three years. how many months? Three years. Three years. No? Oh, three years already. Oh, three years. And ten to ten to twelve episodes. Okay. Then probably we had to do a, you could take down that molinated fragment, try to get back because it's a fragment measurement is not more than 15%, isn't it? That uh, whatever the well, molinated. The, the, the overall width of the fragment was around four millimeter from anterior to posterior. So if you take uh, uh, an average glenoid of 28, 27, 28, so 14, four out of 14 would be around 15, 20 percent anyway. OK. Yeah. I'm curious, guys, if it's so old fracture, if uh, I should do bone grafting, maybe. And the bone card repair over it. From Ilya Crest. Yeah. I think, you know, that's becoming more and more popular now. You know, the FOSS has shown us nice little uh, mini open. So Martin, you will do if it was an uh, extra articular, extra -articular was, uh, bone grafting, Martin? <coughs> You'll choose yeah, an extra yes. articular bone graft? Yes, re release, the, release the labrum, remove the old uh, fragment, and then uh, place the bone block and uh, fix it uh, extra articular, yes. Martin, yeah, would, would it change the plan? If it was the anterior, you have a viable fragment anteriorly. Um, most of the time we take down that and then refix it. Um, why, why take an aggressive approach? I fix it when it's fresh, but when it's old, then I think it's uh, the bone is not very good quality. So I, uh, when I have old uh, uh, bone bone loss uh, or like fragment, then I usually used to remove it and do the bone block procedure. But I come to the I come to it later when I have the lecture. <laughs> Vish, do we have the results there? Yeah, Mark, it's been interesting to see as the conversations kind of progressed. It was uh, almost 50-50. But 63% uh, are suggesting that they would take down <clears throat> the malunited bone and, and fix it um, with an anchor. And then 31% are saying an advancement of labrum um, from the fragment to the glenoid. OK, that's, that's interesting. I think if you're in France or in Europe, I think you would definitely go for a bone graft. Uh, because looking at Lafosse's results with the posterior bone graft. Uh, Nobody, nobody thought about subscap tenodesis. No. At all? no, no. I mean, we did see, you know, some guys suggesting that actually more investigations required. So five percent wanted more investigation. What Can more investigations? Did somebody mention? No, not mentioned exactly what, but that's what had come forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's interesting. 
front. This is your plan. So, yeah, so that was my plan because uh, I didn't see a very convincing <clears throat> labor religion in the MRI. And I know that this guy is subluxating at least three to four times an year. So there and there was no voluntary component, although he was Brayton score six by nine. So it's a posterior glenoid artery fracture leading to posterior subluxation, producing pain and instability. And only advancement wouldn't bring the malunited fragment uh, to its level and support the bone. Width of the fragment is only four millimeters, so it's not suitable for screw fixation because I'm a shatter it and it's three years old. So I thought of going ahead with doing an arthroscopic astrotomy of bony bank card and fixation with anchors. So as soon as I entered the shoulder, this was done in a uh, lateral decubitus and the posterior level was totally frayed. And can we just run the video for a second, Mark? I don't think this video runs. Sorry. Don't worry. So the, as soon as I went in, uh, the question was finding the defect and I didn't find any. Uh, uh, if you go to the previous slide, Mark. Yeah. So there was no clear cut lesion of the labrum from the uh, uh, on the injured area. As soon as I debrided a little bit of uh, fibrous tissue from there, I could see the cleavage. Can you go to the next slide? And then it was just a question of gently tapping and uh, go, to, go to the site of uh, malunion and take it down. Uh, just I'm sorry, I didn't realize. I didn't realize these were videos, so I didn't check. Them no, 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 no problem. No problem, Mark. It doesn't make much difference. If we just can go ahead. Can we go ahead? Uh, sorry, let me go to the next. No, no problem. Just the next slide, please. So the medial lateral dimension of the fragment was, as you can see, it's a very big fragment after I had completely taken it down and mobilized. It was around 12 millimeter on the pre-op CT as well and uh, attempt to do a double pulley or a bridge technique did not succeed. I did try even with the sleeve lifting the fragment off, but uh, then that would have left the sutures extra articular. So uh, this, this didn't work uh, and the fragment didn't move beyond four to five millimeter above the articular surface. So the attempts uh, to go around the fragment did not succeed. So I just went on to to do a, just a single point fixation, just one inferior and one superior as I had proposed. Uh, and this is this is what the, I could lateralize the fragment and fix it with just two anchors, one superior and one inferior. I did not put any anchor in, in the middle of the uh, fragment because that could have produced the tilt medially. Uh, and later on uh, could produce some arthritis due to the tilted fragment. So I avoided the, uh, the central anchor insertion. Can we go ahead? Uh, and the other thing I like about this, it looks like the head is better centered now as well. Yeah. And this was the accident. I haven't seen the patient after this because of the lockdown and the patient came from 700 kilometers away. So this was just telephonic post-op interview. Earlier, he could not take the left turn uh, because it was his right shoulder and that produced internal rotation and he got tired in uh, driving after 50, 50 kilometers but he's achieved near normal range of movement. It's mild discomfort in overall activities. He had to start early mobilization because he had to carry his parents who developed COVID. Uh, he had to drive them to the hospital and he did not even inform me, but he is doing reasonably well. And uh, the, I asked him to go the x-rays at five weeks. So he had a well positioned fragment, but the union was a bit of a concern, uh, but five weeks is too early. Uh, Mark, can we go to the next slide? No, I, I, I received this uh, CT images this morning, uh, which shows a uh, union. Uh, Mark, I had sent you the, could we include that, Mark? Um, let me see if they've arrived yet. Um, yeah, but anyway, when, when, uh, his CT so shows said, a complete union. Of, yeah. It shows a nice union uh, yeah. as well at the same time. And you, you use the Marotta classification to sort of decide how you're going to approach these well, cases? Well, the, the reason being that because the posterior instability is quite poorly understood uh, and it's very difficult to understand. But I think the lesson I learned 
uh, is the most important question when we are dealing with the posterior instabilities, whether there is a voluntary component or not. Patients will never complain of instability, it's all pain and very subtle symptoms. And they actually may not demonstrate the voluntary component until unless probed for. So this is my lesson that in every patient, whether it's an anterior or posterior instability, we need to ask whether there is a voluntary component. Can you do it? Can you show me how or how does it happen? And this probably brings them on. And of course, the uh, moroder classification, it is, it's simple because type 1 is all conservative and type 2 is all surgical. And it's a first time subluxation, dislocation. It's actually the B group, which is very difficult to understand whether it is functional or structural. C is quite simple because it's constitutional and as we pointed out, early age group. And the type 2, the A2 can convert into C2. And we see in India very common because we see seven months old, eight months old, one year old neglected posterior dislocations. So this kind of tells you the pathoanatomy, the causation and the approach. So I actually like this classification quite a lot. Oh, it's, this really is a fantastic uh, case to highlight all the problems that we do have with posterior. It gives us a nice care approach. Uh, thank you very much. Um, then we'll go on to the next. Um, we could never have a controversies meeting without bringing up our old favorite, the <laughs> slap chair. So, uh, Dr. Sidorajan, um, known as the captain of Combator, please uh, tell us all about how you've solved slap lesions for us. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, the, here, I think I already you commented that it's a controversial subject. So, this is a 28 years old gentleman from Maldives. Uh, he, he works in a resort where he involved in lifting weights, uh, the overhead weights too. And he presented with the pain in the shoulder for three months following lifting a heavy weight uh, in the resort work. He didn't mention what kind of work, but he was lifting something. Then he developed pain over his uh, uh, right shoulder, which is a dominant shoulder for him. Then following that, he, he gets pain whenever he does overhead activities. And he tried conservative management in form of uh, physiotherapy and, uh, and NSAIDs from his local uh, hospital in Maldives. And uh, he came here for further management after failed conservative management. On inspection, he had a just mild wasting of uh, deltoid and no uh, point specific tenderness over any over, uh, anywhere over the joint. Of course, uh, that is the uh, uh, his clinical picture shows that uh, no obvious wasting except mild deltoid wasting. Scapular position is okay. Next slide, please. And his movements are fine. He, is, he doesn't have any pain, comfortable abduction and forward flexion, no external rotation restriction. And next slide, he has got some slight internal rotation restriction compared to the normal side. Next slide, please. Uh, he had O-brain test positive and speed test was painful and also Job's test was painful. And his apprehension test was uh, negative. Next slide, please. Okay, so our first question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think this highlights the difficulty we have in making a clear diagnosis for slap lesions. Yes. So uh, there, there are many, many articles on this high specificity for slap lesions. So if we could bring up the next poll. Um, we, I know we all have our favorite methods. And what we think provides us with the safest specificity or in some cases uh, sensitivity um, what, you, what, what, what is your feeling on this uh, Sundar? so usually I think we feel it's a usually combination of the test uh, because we know that uh, some of the test has got the low sensitivity high specificity and some tests shows high specificity and low sensitivity so usually it's a combination of the factors and basically ruling out all other diagnoses, then you usually come to a uh, conclusion that this patient may be having a slap tattoo uh, because isolated tests are very rare and usually it's a combination. And most of the time it is masked with some other pathologies like labral tear or some uh, cough pathologies too. So usually I go ahead with the speed test, Wobrian's test, which, uh, which usually gives some uh, information. And then usually I combined with the clinical examination. 
Yeah, sorry, I've made a mistake on the slide. This should be sensitivity for slap lesions. The positive yeah. test in the presence of disease. Sorry. Yeah. Have we got those results yet, Vish? Yeah, indeed. 95% would go for the active compression, Mark. Okay, that's interesting. They okay. think it's that sensitive. Because it really starts off the way I put it here, it goes from the lowest to the highest. Uh, your Jurgensen test is about 13% uh, sensitive, whereas your O'Brien or active compression test is 65%, which is exactly the same as the Hawkins test as well, which is quite interesting. And I know we normally have combinations. My favorite combination was O'Brien's test with a relocation of Job. I think it's about 85%. Um, but you know, a lot of the combinations uh, increase your sensitivity. Dr. Sindra, here are your x-rays. Uh, x-rays are found to be normal. Um, so the MRI had showed, I mean, of course, we know that MR arthrogram is the gold standard for diagnosing the slap tear. MRI as, as, uh, still, the, we don't uh, do the routinely as an MRI arthrogram. This patient came with MRI suspecting a slap tear of uh, both uh, uh, coronal and the actual views showing that some suspecting a slap tear. Of course, other views of showing the labral tear are found to be normal. So that's why I didn't put on the that particular sections. So we suspected isolated uh, uh, slap tear in this condition, sometimes may be associated with the anterior labral tear, even though clinically it is uh, negative test, apprehension test is negative because many times these patients have a micro instability, then they can have a combined tear with the slap. So because this patient is a three months uh, 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 failed conservative management, he had flew from Maldives for here for further management, then we want to go ahead with uh, further management. And this is the intraoperative uh, view, this is a lateral uh, position. And uh, this is the viewing from the posterior side and rod, switching rod from the anterior side. As you can see that there is a, a slap tear extending to the slightly into the posterior labrum, but otherwise the anterior and the posterior labrum was intact. We come to our next poll question, because I think, I think yeah. we've seen over, over Mark, the years. Uh, Mark, can I ask one question from all the faculties at this point before we move on to the poll? Um, how many yes, of sir. us actually, you know, when we say the slap, anterior and posterior, how many of us actually today in 2021 see this typical slap? Do we not see more of the posterior superior liberal tear? It is on the top and then it actually extends always posteriorly. It hardly ever extends anteriorly. Raman, what's your take? Well, uh, when you suspect a slap, I usually found a type 2, which and that depends on where the biceps anchor insertion has been. So uh, if the biceps anchor even, uh, is even in, fiber, in this case, if you see it is extending a bit more posteriorly. You know, it is. It, it is. Goes, it the starts bicep... from 12. It usually starts from 12 and goes up to 10, sometimes yeah. up to 9. Because in 60 to 70 percent of patients, the biceps inserts posteriorly. That's the normal configuration of the biceps anchor insertion. In majority of the cases, in 60 percent, it inserts posteriorly. That's why we see it has to peel off from where it is inserted, and that's why we see the tear extension beyond 12 o'clock posteriorly. Uh, but uh, Interesting would be the criteria which the poll, uh, which uh, Mark is putting the poll, which Sundar is putting the poll. Yeah, I think you know, these are often overdiagnosed. Um, and then just to go back, I think in Morgan's original article and his description, uh, most of them were posterior superior. So these are the, you know, all being um, reported as important criteria for the diagnosis of a type 2 slap lesion. Uh, I'd be very interested to hear what everybody feels. Is it one single one or the number of ones that could be a number of those criteria? Um, so there could, there could be a number of different answers for this one. Yeah, Mark. Um... <clears throat> Certainly, there's a front runner here, and that's the positive active peel back, followed by displaceable biceps root at 32 percent. So interesting. Yes. So does does everybody take the traction off and put the arm into abduction external rotation? That's how you need to diagnose an active peel back. 
I don't know. That's that's yeah. one of the most tricky things, especially those who do it in lateral position are in trouble. Do it yeah. the things in beach chair, maybe I'm you sure. can, but lateral means you got to take out everything. Yeah, you got to unhook your traction. Uh, you, I do it, but it's and I'm surprising think, that's the most common way. Nilesh? Uh, yeah, I think I, so effectively I try to probe it, but I don't do a complete uh, release of traction and do a posterior peelback. But having said that, I also look for chondral fraying, which is not there as an option. Uh, so many times, and we do agree that slabs tend to be overdiagnosed. But if there is a posterior superior chondral fraying, which we see as soon as you enter into the joint, and I have already decided that I need to operate on this patient, then probably I wouldn't hesitate. Coming to the anterior and posterior fixation of the, of the labral anchor, of the biceps anchor, most of them would all be posterior superior fixation. Anterior anchor comes in only in cases of a pan labral tear or if it's an extension of the bankard tear. I, uh, can I say something? Um, the, for me, I routine, I, I don't do the peel back. Uh, I only do the, uh, I try to displace the biceps anchor root insertion into the joint. If I'm able to do that, if my probe slips over the anchor, I'm not able to displace it. I think this is not a slap. Of course, in addition, there are other criteria, as you said, the depth of the sulcus more than four millimeter. My probe dips there, I am able to lift it. And so if you are able to lift it and it's displaceable, definitely in an indicated patient, you should be heading towards repair. Uh, especially if the only complaint of the patient has been that he cannot. In India, everybody plays cricket on the Sunday. So if the patient says he cannot throw from the boundary, he can throw underarm, but he cannot throw overarm. That's where the slap kicks in, in my experience. I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have, do we, have we got the results for this yet, Vish? Um, unfortunately not. Um, just bear with me. Mark, sorry, the poll has just come up now, guys, so I'll come back to you in 30 seconds or so. Okay, fantastic. Uh, just going around quickly, uh, especially from Europe. Martin, do you see slap lesions in Europe? Of course, so we see slap lesions. Uh, people here play a lot of uh, hand handball, how it's called. Ah, so overhead cool. injuries uh, of the shoulder, especially young uh, women. Uh, so and um, and um, I don't do spill back, but I try to lift it, try to pu push the ten uh, biceps tendon into joint to see if it dislocate the. And it's it's posterior superiorly, of course, and I think usually. In many cases, it uh, it goes quite posteriorly, actually, the mm -hmm. uh, slaps. So we see quite many of them, yes. And as I, as he mentioned, they usually train uh, the degenerative ones. If they come here after like three, four months, they have already already been training and rehabilitating, and they don't have effect of it. So then then we do the surgery. If there is acute injury, if any, like somebody doing sport actively, then we can do it uh, quite quickly. But uh, degenerative slap tears, uh, we wait. Uh, I think it, that, that's a very important point. I think uh, operate, don't operate too quickly. A lot of these can be settled down by sorting out typically the scapular dyskinesia, uh, stretching out the capsule and re restoring the throwing mechanics. Vish, do we have that answer yet? Indeed, yeah. So 87% would repair um, versus 12% that would consider tetodesis. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Uh, is there a video running? Yeah. So I, I here I made it um, uh, through the anterior portal. I used the aggressive shaver to prepare the bony bed. Uh, I don't use the burr because the chances of uh, taking out bore, bone. So even aggressive shaver is more than enough to, to remove the cartilage to have a good bleeding surface. To use the portal on the superior side, super, anterior superior or the, through the cuff is debatable. Here I made it just uh, uh, lateral to the rotator cuff interval, just uh, marginally uh, compromising the rotator cuff. And this is my first laso uh, on 25 degree laso where I can 
uh, I uh, exchange with the suture tab. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so it's exchanged with the suture tab. The make sure that technically when you do uh, here, I'm planning to do. Uh, I, I was planning to do the knotless anchor. Uh, it's important that you take both the sutures at the, through the same uh, uh, grab uh, your suture retriever so that there is no soft tissue interposition or you can use a cannula, but cannula will be too big to use in this, especially if you are going through the anterior cuff. So I usually avoid using the uh, cannula over here. So that is a video uh, mark. If you can run the video, it can you can run. Sorry. And the both the both the side you can run it up. So here we can make the, make sure that we have the any enough levering space for the uh, peak anchor to go in. So it should not tighten too much. So you should have a, uh, enough lever arm for the uh, suture tape. So you can see that I had kept so much lever arm so that I don't want to put a biceps anchor. It's a dynamic structure. You don't want to put in too much tension over there. So here, preferably I prefer the pink peak uh, not less push lock anchor over over here. And uh, this is the second anchor. I think uh, the one more video which I wanted to show to show the trajectory because you guys, yes, I already told even we we were told that it is extending more posteriorly. So usually the if you go through the superior supraspinal test, we'll have a more perpendicular trajectory rather than coming through the um, anterolateral. But still here I could use the, the through the same portal which I used for my first anchor. Still I could go ahead and finish it with the second anchor. Uh, but preferably, I always use uh, peak anchors because the bio anchor, there's possibility it can break, especially the trajectory is very difficult to achieve when you go more posteriorly. So that was the final repair uh, by using the two uh, suture tape with the knotless uh, peak push lock anchor. Next slide. This patient from Maldives and uh, he had sent, uh, uh, again, they done an MRI because he's, uh, he's, uh, he doesn't have any pain, he started going back to activities. Already it's, an, it's a one year follow up. This patient sent to the MRI uh, showing the uh, good healing of the uh, slap lesion. I think I know uh, this. Okay, we can we can go ahead with uh, debating whether to do a tenodosis or a uh, base uh, uh, repair. Uh, I think 86% in the poll question went for repair. I'm happy because I did the repair. But I know that yeah. uh, I know that literature slowly going towards the biceps stenosis. Mark, if you want, we can debate that with other faculty. I was going to ask my next question. The patient was 35 years old. What did you do? Mark, what's the age you said? 25, 35. 35. 35. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think then. <laughs> Don't the spanner. You know, most of us are now, you know, first of all, we have to always question the diagnosis of slap. You know, in a 35, is it a radiological slap or you, you know, because they'll have tendinopathy, they'll have all combination of funny signs coming positive, some empty can positive, some small footprint changes in the cuff, some fraying of the cuff. So as far as possible, be conservative. If it doesn't work, then you go ahead, debride and do the tenodesis. I mean, I, I would at the moment start tilting towards more towards the tenodesis. And uh, Mark, before you go ahead with the next question, let me ask all the panelists one question. How is your experience regarding the happiness of the patient when it comes to, you know, when we repair the anterior labrum for instability and especially these posterior superior labral tear whom we have operated for pain? I, I think my patients, about 30% patients do not, I mean, they are always a bit unhappy even at the end of one year. They say, I'm fine, yeah, but it occasionally hurts. Is that so, uh, Sundar? Yeah, before going to the other faculty, the number of isolated slap tear, which I do repair also very, very, very less. Maybe the last four years, I might have operated five or six cases. So most correct, of them correct. are combined cases, I do the repair. So naturally, the diagnosis, maybe this kind of, typically they should have, a, as you said, all the first, uh, first poll question, what Mark showed, like a sulcus depth with the PLP, all the uh, findings which showed that slap tear, which is extending to the, posterior labral tear pertaining causing the problem failed considerate treatment then i go and do these repairs so because my number is also very very low to say but all these patients are doing well so far maybe the diagnosis and choosing the patient right patient for the repair is very critical uh, can i say something vivek yes yes sir, yes, sir. so the 
and the, one of the reasons we can have a, a pain post slap repair could be an overtight repair so the as emphasize that don't don't because it's a biceps is a dynamic structure a second common uh, factor yeah, could be I, I catching the again, cat that's 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 one reason i think sundar very uh, rightly pointed and we also yes. tried to put yes. the anchor you know as far as possible from the root of the biceps because that's one thing i learned from the yap you know about 12 years back never ever you know you know you don't put a noose around the biceps stay away from biceps the rest of the labrum you repair second and thing. also secondly most of the time we don't try to take the capsule in contrast capsule. to what yes. we do anterior yeah so despite the, that Raman, yeah mm -hmm. despite that you know that happiness quotient is not the same as compared to the anterior I mean, Probably, though we are repairing see, a kind of a labrum. I understand, but we cannot, we cannot uh, uh, extrapolate the findings of uh, highly competitive athletes to general weekend warriors. You know, yeah, we so it depends what kind of patient you are treating. All these studies which say the slap shouldn't be repaired after 35, they are dealing with uh, elite athletes and they have not been happy, in, mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. generally speaking. Uh, after 35 years of age, so their return to sports is around 40 to 50 percent in most of the series. Uh, so that's why probably Tino disease, and as Pascal Bolu had shown, that Tino disease fared much better. Um, so I think people are moving away from lab repair, but I think choosing the right patient at Sundar said is extremely critical. I, I went through the, all the systemic reviews. Uh, I think there is a recent systemic review last year in the uh, AJSM in the overhead athlete. But if you see the cases which they compared with the repair and tenodosis, because all these years we are doing only repair, the, only the last two, three years, the tenodosis number are increasing. So if it's like a nine is to one, the, most of the systemic review which you compared around, if you have patients around 800 patient means that 600 patients are repaired, only 100, and 200, 100 or 200 patients were then a tenodosis. But all these systemic review are shown that bet, as Vivek said, the satisfaction rate is better in a tenodosis group yep. than the yep. repair group. Yeah. No, we're going to be careful of those, a lot of those systemic uh, reviews. Um, the methodology is very poor there. Most of those are between two, level two and level four. There's only one, only about three level one studies. The most important one, which is always fascinates me, is came out of uh, BMJ a few years ago. Um, I don't know how it passed ethics approval. It was done by well, Schroeder, I think it was. They had about 120 patients. And they completely blinded um, patients to either a sham repair, just putting a scope in, the next one putting a scope and repairing, and the next one putting a scope and doing a tenodesis. Two years follow up, no difference between any of the three. So, <laughs> yeah, that let's is choose a, our patients. Yeah, there's a British Journal of uh, Sports Medicine. So I think anything coming from British, <laughs> we have to be very careful. <laughs> <laughs> we, we know what the calcaneal fractures. They said that you do, should not operate calcaneal fracture uh, by doing this. Uh, I mean, same kind of randomized study. But we don't know about the inclusion criteria. Really, it was very very suspicious. Same is, same is true for proper proper study. Proper trial. Proper trial. Yeah. Proper trial. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Everybody agrees that in the setting of bone loss, uh, surgery is far more likely. What is meaningful bone loss? What techniques and what con constructs are continually evolving? So Dr. Martin Polacek, also known as the Don of Drama, uh, he's going to enlighten us. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to uh, talk here. And uh, so I will start with case. It's a 36-year-old male uh, who have had many dislocations, or over 100, uh, and he can uh, dislocate the shoulder during no normal range of motion when he just lift his uh, shoulder so it can uh, pop out. He can uh, usually he used to relocate it by himself, but uh, sometimes he had to be admitted to emergency department for relocation. He has a uh, normal range of motion, but he has really positive apprehension test and he's really afraid of doing uh, the abduction. So here we see the MRI. In my clinic, usually all patients came to us with MRI already done pri in, at private clinics. So here we see the quite huge heel sex lesion and uh, we see bone loss anteriorly. And um, here we can, uh, of course, quantify the heel sac lesion which is quite uh, large actually. 
And here you see the 3D city. Uh, we see bone loss anteriorly. And then uh, it, it's good, I think, here to quantify also the hill sucks lesion because uh, uh, if the glenoid here is 30 uh, millimeters and then the bone loss may be 30%, then you need uh, only 15 millimeters uh, hill suck to, to be off track. And here, I uh, try to measure it here, calculate it. I think it's about maybe 20, 25, 30% bone loss. It's not really like uh, exact uh, science, but it's quite uh, good bone loss here. And we have the poll now. Yes, what is the critical bone loss in uh, your clinic? Yeah, it's interesting, uh, Martin. Um, you obviously use your method of sort of estimating the bone loss is the sort of the perfect circle or uh, yes. just interesting to hear what the rest of the, you know, we've got that, we've got that's the Sagaya method, we've got Gerber's method, the index, we've got uh, Pico, we're looking at the area, we've got George Athwell's method, looking, what does everybody use or do we just ask the radiologist to work it out for us? Uh, Dr. Sunda? What do you use? Yeah, we, we use the uh, Glenard face view 3D and our radiologist measure the uh, measurement. We see the use of the same uh, best fit circle and uh, do the calculation and give the percentage. So, we saw, we saw I, an MRI earlier on there. Um, does anybody, nobody's mentioned on track or off track. Does anybody measure, does anybody understand it? Yes, I think uh, we measure yes. it and we have developed a technique also to measure it intraoperatively. We are in the process of publishing it and it almost matches. Um, though we find sometimes difficulty because there's a labrum overhang uh, posteriorly. So, and but it almost matches and our radiologists, they always mention the off track and on track. Okay. Or uh, almost once it was published, since then we have been measuring for a long time and they have mastered this technique. Yeah, likewise, all our radiologists, all our cases, our radiologists would mention an on-track or an off-track lesion, and uh, that that definitely helps in uh, in probably planning our diagnosis, planning our management. But uh, Mark, I'll tell you something. I we I personally have been a bit of you know, it's a bit you know dicey thing. This off-track and on-track, especially one millimeter difference can make it off-track. One mm. millimeter difference makes it on-track. Number one. Number two is, you know, what no one knows what happens in the dynamic status. Like somebody who's trying to throw something, something which is marginally on track can actually be very critically, you can say, off track in the dynamic. So the whole study, um, you know, by this Yamamoto has been a very static study. So two things. One is slightest of the error and your, uh, you know, the marking can be off track. And two, we don't know what's, what happens during the dynamic play of the shoulder. So Vivek, as I say that humeral head has engaged against the anterior glenoid. We are not able to reproduce it. That doesn't mean it didn't engage. I, I just want to comment also because this is very dyna dynamic, uh, I think, problem because usually the patients have, uh, I think, the shoulder, if they realize in the muscles, the shoulder is subluxated or luxated actually. Uh, and so uh, I think the main uh, uh, main uh, thing here is that uh, the more bone loss anterior you have, the smaller heel sac you need to be in order to engage in uh, to the edge. So um, for me, it's that question because all the measurements is plus minus. It's not really exact. So we need to see a little bit dynamic uh, how the shoulder behaves when you come into the shoulder. And we will see it in my case that it was not not doubt here that. Uh, that the hill sack was engaging. Yes. Do we have the results here, Vish? Yes, thanks, Mark. Um, quite varied, to be honest. So 15 to 20 percent uh, came in at 38. Um, at the top was 20 to 25 percent, 52 percent, and then 25 to 30 percent, 10 percent. I think it sort of reflects, you know, the a lot of the newer studies, if you look at Shah and Shin and Provincia, they're all you know, talking about 12, 14s of the Japanese studies, and uh, they also in the round about 15s. Uh, DiGiacomo uses 25% of his cutoff for on-track, off-track. Uh, originally, 
Uh, Greece talked about 30% uh, in biomechanical studies. So we don't we don't have the answer. And I think Moroda wrote about that recently. We don't know what the threshold is. So we, we do definitely have to consider a lot of the other criteria when making our decisions. Can I just comment this? Because it's uh, I think it's very interesting if you look at the traditions uh, around the world what people do and what, what is the critical bone loss it's i think it's uh, really about sometimes about the traditions and do you see in the us the people um, have a little bit higher complication rate and uh, they are a little bit uh, um, doing a bone card repair all, and until they have 30 percent then on the other side if you go to france and if you do sport and uh, are under 20 years of age then you will get latache they don't even have to look at mris and then in Europe is around 20, as you mentioned. So it's I think it's also about the traditions, how the guys who have been developing the arthroscopic surgery uh, experience the procedure, actually. Uh, you're absolutely right, Martin. I think you know, all those American fellowship trained surgeons, um, they didn't know how to do an open uh, ladder jet. Uh, I think uh, you just look at the complication rate in the US of ladder jet, you'll understand why they try and expand the indications for an arthroscopic bank card. Mm. So this is our next poll. Um, Vish, do we, do we have anything on that yeah. yet? Yeah, we do indeed. And it's interesting. So certainly some French influence occurring in this part of the world. 91% would say, or well, 85 now would say lavish. Okay. Nice. So Good. should we go next slide? Yeah. What was my reasoning about uh, what to do? Uh, so I think, what is the ideal bone block procedure for me? Uh, I want I want to, it to be arthroscopic. We want to develop arthroscopic surgery, so I want to have arthroscopic procedure. I want it to be anatomical. Uh, then I would like to address other soft tissues, like maybe biceps tendon, uh, labrum, uh, capsule, maybe tendons, you know, uh, whatever. Um, I want to have a low complication rate, and uh, if I don't have to, I don't uh, want to do something with subscapularis. So uh, what should we do? And and of course, I don't want screws in the shoulder because uh, somebody will be talking a little bit about it that the screws you have, you have to remove it and they often irritate. Anteriorly. So what about Latarche? It can be done arthroscopically, yes, but it's uh, technical, difficult, and not many people do it. But uh, normal open Latarche has predictable and documented result. However, it's not anatomical. You usually don't address other soft tissues, and the revisions are usually difficult, and some uh, show quite high compression rate. And what about the screws? They uh, usually need to be removed. And when you do that in the arthroscopically, then it's difficult, I think. What about free bone block? It can be technically demanding, but it's much easier than Latarche. Uh, it's anatomical. You just reconstruct the anatomy that is uh, lost. Uh, it can be done arthroscopically without problems. Then you can address all the other soft tissues, uh, labrum, uh, you can do uh, remplissage, whatever. You don't have to do subscapulary split and uh, you don't need screws for this either. So, next slide. So I decided in, th in this case to use a free iliac crest bone block procedure and I used fiber and targeted cerclages uh, with uh, consequent bone card repair and remplissage. Uh, just I need to mention how I decide if I do the remplissage, uh, you know, because when you come into the shoulder, so shoulder is usually dislocated and not centered against the glenoid. So when I am uh, done with my bone block and the bone card repair and see that still shoulder is a little bit more uh, off-centered, uh, not centered properly, then I do the remplissage. If, if I'm not sure, then I do remplissage. Okay, so run the video. I will comment it. See the typical picture of my patients uh, with bone uh, bone loss, and here we do the bone uh, labrum release. We need to really release all the labrum in order to pull it over the bone block afterwards. Remove the, all the bone fragments, and here I use uh, holding suture and I park it uh, through the five o'clock portal, low anterior portal. So then I have it out of the way, and I can hold the labrum of the way. So I can I have place for bone block and uh, all the things around there. You see, so then I release it completely uh, until the muscle. So 
So really, really important this step too. And then we have the posterior guide and I drill two three millimeter channels. First the inferior channel here, then the superior channel. Then I pass the suture lasso, so we see the remove the cannulation and uh, pass the lasso. Take it out and then we we change the lasso with the suture so it's easier to pass things around there. So and I do it the same uh, super early and I check that I don't have any tangling here. So then I pass the fiber and tiger tape circlage through the inferior channel and out of the anterior portal. As you see, I am using the long uh, passport cannula, 12 millimeters, 5 centimeters, and I cut <laughs> it lengthwise. So then I pass the circlages through the bone block. And then again the through the super channel. Then the bone block is ready to be passed. You can do cocker or something to put it uh, into the joint, pull it, open the shoulder, pu uh, push it in, and uh, do the position of the bone graft. And uh, then you tighten uh, the circulages posteriorly with the with the um, uh, tensioner. Just here, it's very important that uh, you don't. Uh, they are very powerful the tapes, so you can tighten it really much. But I once tried to tighten it to 90 newtons, and then just cut through the block. You know, with the tape, it's so powerful that you will never manage to rupture the tape. You you will cut through the block. So uh, you can tighten maybe 70 is enough. And then uh, we have next slide. I had to change patients because I lost the video from the previous one. So we do the normal fiber take 1.8 anchor using the holding suture to pass the suture around the labrum and then uh, tighten the anchor. And we see that the labrum uh, will uh, really reattach to the glenoid. And I will do one more here or two more. Because that one was brief. And the, the nice thing with 1.8 is you don't have to be afraid to hit the tapes because it doesn't matter. You will not uh, you will not rupture the tape if you drill 1.8 through the fiber tape. It's it will just make a hole in it. So it's not an endanger in it. So if I'm done with this, I still feel like maybe this is not completely centered the shoulder. Then I do the remplissage. I refre refresh the uh, heel sucks lesion. Then uh, I use I use uh, 3.9 knotless corkscrew. Insert it. Two. And then I just pass them uh, in a mattress configuration into each other. So uh, you see here, as you as you use with pasta lesions. So just pass them into each other and then uh, tighten it up. So then you really uh, have a nice uh, replicas here. So that was it. Oh, that's uh, make it look very, very simple there, Martin. Uh, beautiful repair. Um, if you knew you were going to do your replicage, would you have put your anchors in before you tied anteriorly, or you're not too worried about knocking? Not too worried. You can do it I'm right not, at the end. I'm not worried. I'm not worried no. Okay. I, but okay. but it can be if you if you feel that. Uh, but sometimes you have a lot of sutures here, so it can be a little bit confusing to have uh, like six more sutures around there. From the so you, can always, you can always go back and retention anterior anyway if you leave the sutures behind. Yeah, and uh, yeah. and uh, also the one thing to comment here is that uh, uh, lately I have been also experimenting with a little bit with uh, um, buttons and the button fixation and sutures. Um, but the problem with that is first that they are quite it's quite weak fixation with buttons and the suture, and then uh, you should uh, insert your glenoid anchors before you pass the pass the sutures from the buttons. Otherwise, you can risk that you will drill into the suture from the buttons, and then you repeat the like off. But the nice thing with the tape circlage is that it's real powerful, 
And if you if you use 1.8 uh, uh, knotless corks, uh, knotless anchor, so then you don't have to be afraid to drill. Now, and you, you don't have to be afraid either when you're tensioning that you somehow uh, rupture the sutures from the block, you know. So, um, and I and I have also been uh, reading uh, results from other guys from Greece. They have really excellent results using the buttons. And in my uh, clinic, these patients usually are really bad shape and they have like really many dislocations. And then um, this, uh, this open surgery have been really effect, 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 effective and they uh, have re really few recurrence. I don't have actually have any recurrence rate after I started with the tape circlash. So um, I like the procedure very much. So we'll see what happens. I had one complication, then I was uh, tensioning the block to 90 newtons, and then I, all of a sudden it was loose. And then I, I saw that I cut with the tapes through the through the Ilya Crest block, you know, and then I just have to remove the block, uh, take the new one, uh, remove the tapes, drill again and uh, pass the new tapes. So it went very well afterwards. So it's although you get complication, it's uh, not so difficult to get out of it afterwards. And how, how long do you keep your patients in a sling for after this? Yeah, I have six weeks. Normal as a normal bank card repair, six weeks. Yeah. Vish, and do then, we have any more? Sorry, go ahead, Mike. Go ahead. Uh, no, no sorry. Vish, do we have any questions coming in from any of the attendees? Yeah, thanks, Mark. So there is a question coming forward and it's actually related to Larigé procedures. Um, and the question is, you know, what is the role of the plate in a ladder shape procedure? Should it be used and why? I think the, uh, it was meant the Giacomo plate, I think. And it yeah. uh, gives better compression to the block and you have maybe less risk to fracture it. I think. Yeah, but of course, I try to change from screws and uh, I actually I I reserve Latarge at my place uh, for patients where everything else has uh, um, uh, failed, uh, but I have I have not have to do it like last uh, one and a half year because all these procedures are quite the new procedures I think are really effective, and I didn't have to do Latarge yet. No, I use arthroscopic Latarge usually, but uh, I have not done it in one and a half year now. Uh, you're obviously very skilled. I'm, I was never tempted by the arthroscopic latigé. We used to only do open latigé and just about 95% uh, of my patients, which were rugby players, uh, got a latigé. Um, I always used to use the low profile plate, wedge plate, because as you said, yeah, it does give you that little bit of confidence when you're tightening the screws um, and better compression, less likelihood of fracturing the the bone block, but um, oh, and my sorry. Was slightly different. A few more questions coming forward here. So, um, Martin, were you planning a ramp cassage preoperatively? Uh, yes, I do plan for it, but uh, sometimes it all everything fits so well that I don't have to. I don't do it, but but uh, usually you are a little bit in doubt. Is it enough? You know, is the labral repair is it good enough? You know. And and is shoulder centered really precisely in the, against the glenoid? Then I do remplissage, so I have really low uh, indication uh, to for remplissage. So I just do it, no problem. If I'm a little bit in doubt, I do it. Excellent. Another question: Iliac bone crest. Um, you know, is there a concern of osteolysis with it being a static fixation? Yeah, so that's that's always the question with osteoly osteolysis because uh, I read uh, lately an uh, article about the biomechanic in the glenoid and they found out that uh, the the part of the bone which is uh, um, which is um, uh, 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 yeah, how do you call it like uh, engaged in the movement of the shoulder it will uh, remodel to that. Uh, to be like anatomical you now, and the and the rest of the bone block will uh, disappear, and that's the problem, um, because the body always wants to reconstruct the right anatomy, and the, if you have the screws, then the screws will uh, irritate in the soft tissues anteriorly. So you don't have this problem with the tapes, uh, because you always get osteolysis, but uh, if you have tapes, so it doesn't matter. They so don't one have. Last 
One last question for you, Martin. Okay, actually, a couple of more coming through. I do apologise. So, um, which portal would you use to place the bone block? Uh, I don't need to do subscapular portal. I place it through the through the standard anterior portal, which I uh, make a little bit larger so I can put my finger into the joint. Then I know that the portal is large enough, and for, to be sure that I don't have and get any soft tissues. Uh, uh, tangled into the bone block, then I uh, use uh, five uh, five centimeter long and twelve millimeter diameter Pasper cannula, and I cut it lengthwise like you do in supercapsular construction. So I make sure that I put the bone block into the joint. I do. You don't have to do subscapular split here. Thanks, Martin. One last question, guys, due to time constraints. So, you know, will your rehab differ from arthroscopic laryngite? when considering this procedure? Actually, actually not. Uh, I If I would do Latache or, uh, or, or Bankard or um, this uh, bone block procedure, I would uh, usually have uh, six weeks with a sling and then uh, train training with physiotherapist rehabilitation. Oh. Thanks, Vish. Um, thank you, Martin. Great case. A uh, lot to learn there and look forward to seeing uh, that progressing as well in future. So I'd, I'd just like to take uh, just thank the, the faculty for their time and effort for their excellent contribution. Uh, to all of you, I hope this webinar has provided some clarity in treating you know, the more common controversies that we have in shoulder instability. So if there are no further comments, uh, please be safe out there during this pandemic. Our thoughts are with you and the wonderful people of India whose hospitality I've enjoyed over the last two decades. So good night to everyone and uh, God bless. Thank you very much to all. Thank you, Vish. Thanks, Ali. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mark. Thank, 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 thank you, Vish. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.